are TFR, Truth Frequency Radio. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one. And they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant and they bare great giants whose height was 3,000 L's, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts, reptiles and fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. The Book of Enoch, Chapter 7. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. And tonight, as a follow-up from yesterday evening, and I'm honored to have as guests with me again, author Gary Wang. Gary, are you there, brother? I am, and uh, so happy to be back with you again tonight, and uh, really enjoyed the show we did last night, and I think tonight's show is going to be you know, even more intriguing. Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely one of the favorite topics of uh, the listening audience, and especially for those that are new uh, to it as subject matter, um, even though it was one of those things that long ago initially intrigued me. You know, Genesis 6 was one of those chapters that just jumps out at you and asks and begs you to seek deeper into it. And I know it was one of those that caught you and uh, thus your book Genesis 6 Conspiracy which I'd like you to uh, you know let everybody know about and also your contact website and all that information Gary yeah so the uh, the book that I authored is called the Genesis 6 Conspiracy how the secret societies and the descendants of giants plan to enslave humankind and it's a 6,000 year transgenerational investigation into the conspiracy that conspiracy that begins in prehistory, produces the giants and the organizational structure that caused the flood, how it crosses the flood, how it's affected, how they've affected our history, what they're doing today, and how they're planning to bring about the end times. So um, one of those books that is kind of, I think is kind of unique on the market that connects more dots and more things in the whole scheme of things than any other book that's out there and a lot on giants, no doubt about that. So you can uh, get a hold of my book through my website at the Genesis six conspiracy.com. That's Genesis six uh, conspiracy.com with the number six. And on there, I've got a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters to give you a good feel for the book. You can also connect over to Barnes and Noble and Amazon and the Kindle version from there. And it's available on bookstores. And if it's not and you want to support your uh, local bookstore, it can be ordered through Bookmasters, who distributes the book. And uh, also in Canada, it's available through Chapters and Indigos. So if you wanted to get a hold of me, there's an email on the website. You can also get a hold of me through Facebook under Gary Wayne and Twitter at GaryWayne63. And I just wanted to underscore what you're talking about in uh, Genesis 6 uh, verses 1 through 4, which is, you know, the preamble to the flood. And a lot of people don't connect it as being part of the flood story. But it's one of those verses that um, you know, when, I, when I was researching the Bible and logging all the different prophecy narratives very early on and starting in Genesis 1 and then getting through to 6 and all of a sudden you read those four verses and your eyes kind of pop open and right. my first reaction was <laughs> what was what's that all about I never really noticed that before but I just kind of ignored it right I'm going ah, no 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 I'm, I'm, I'm looking to uh, document all the different prophecy streams that run through the Bible but trouble is they just keep coming up uh, right. after the flood and all their interrelationships and you know for me one of the principles that I believe in in terms of prophecy now because I've dug so deeply into this and it just fit right into my passion for prophecy is that 
to understand prophecy properly, you need to understand prehistory and you need to understand right. giants and their relationship to angels and how they've affected things all, all the way through. So to me, you're, you just don't get the whole picture for prophecy um, if you don't understand uh, prehistory and the giants and the angels and the dragons and everything else. And, you know, last night you had talked about Isaiah 13 and 14, which is a prophecy and also an end time prophecy. And again, you're never going to get the understanding of Isaiah 13 and 14 if you don't understand prehistory. Right. Yes. And, um, you know, the esoteric aspect of this particular uh, topic, and it's one that um, is not well, you know, as far as modern humanity, modern history, we just chalk it all up to fantasy, fairy tale, and something that, you know, just children's stories, rather than really uh, looking at and examining the whole context of what is being revealed within these five verses. And I consider them to be very important because as you said unless you understand the fullness of the story it's hard to make sense of how we even got to be where we are now and especially for uh, go ahead gary well i was going to say you know all throughout history we have this feudal system for lack of a better word and not to insult other cultures but you have for the most part, you have a pantheon of gods uh, that have the representative kings and all of their relatives are the elite and the nobles. And then you've right. got all the humans who are the poor, right? right? And if you don't understand how that came about and who the descendants of the giants are, you have no idea what has been done to our people and our history and what they're planning to do in the future. Right, exactly. And, you know, they... Um, asserted themselves and gathered power so very long ago that it's been just passed down and it's just been more centralized, more controlled and more um, as far as the, you know, them gathering and controlling all aspects of all the affairs of humanity. It just does not make sense unless you understand, you know, the origins of it all and how, the um, yeah. you know the powers the principalities they have controlled you it go, forever long yes and you know uh the you know the the descendants of the giants i mean they still pray and worship the pantheon of gods right sorry about that um, oh, good. and <laughs> he's gone now <laughs> and we love so, animals. Uh, yeah, I love my little Riley, but he likes <laughs> to be famous too. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what people don't understand is, you know, you go back a hundred years ago in Western society and, you know, not even less um, in other societies is that the elite, the noble class considered the poor mundane, uh, less uh, they were they were considered inferior, not worth educating, not worth considering worthy of life. And again, it goes back to who they believe they are, that they are the bloodlines of, of the giants and that they were part, you know, they come from the gods and, and the demigods and that they are superior to the mundane human race. Right. And if you don't get that, I mean, you just don't understand anything that's really going on in the Bible and, you know, the prophecies of the metallic dynasties and the great empires and how that's all interrelated. It's just this sort of core understanding as to what's going on. Yes, absolutely. And um, that's why, you know, in the research that both of you, you and I do, we like to look at all of the the different mythologies, the legends, and the uh, just the oral traditions from people all over the world. Because in doing so, and running all those accounts parallel to one another, you're able to fill in what are gaps on truth uh, and what most people won't even consider or even piece together just because they think it's all nonsensical and meaningless. We're able to really um, bring together a narrative that is cohesive to better help understand as far as the you know people that read and study our work to better understand the the bigger picture and how it all connects together 
like my friend Dr. Joyce, she wrote from Eden to Armageddon, and really that's that's what it is. It's the beginning. I, I cover it from the war in heaven all the way to the end of days. And so, uh, you wanted to comment there, Gary? I I, I do because uh, it it is just so so important. Um, the things that you know that you're underlining on this stuff that um, if we don't have that sort of core belief, that core understanding, that additional context as what you're now overlaying onto it, that the polytheist cultures right. believe and documented, although it's from a polytheist lens, it's still talking about the same events. So what exactly. we learned from that is some other details, whether it's a biased detail or not, it's a detail nonetheless. We also learn about how they think and, and how they believed and how, what they did with those beliefs. And what's important about all that is, is what they're doing with those beliefs today because they're the ones who want to bring about the end time. They're the ones who have basically controlled history. So if we want to understand the adversary, we need to get into their shoes a little bit to have some understanding. Still measure everything against what's written in the Bible and consider everything else as interesting in context that fills in some of the gaps. But to understand what the other side is thinking is really, really important. And when we get into the book of Og tonight, which we, we will, I mean, people will learn that they don't think very highly of humans. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so let's, let's take it back as far as you can uh, with regard to what you've looked at in your research. Um, Cause you know, I think it even predates Atlantis and that Atlantis was in our memory, in our collective memory, as far as humanity, that goes back into the very far distant past. And I think that the Bible even speaks about um, these primordial and pre-Diluvian peoples and, you know, how when there was a uh, not yet man and the birds of the wilderness fled and the cities of the wilderness were destroyed, all these different things, it speaks about that. And so... Can you talk about, because you look at and examine, so what was it in your research that leads you back to the most ancient of sources, cultures, um, what seems to be the mother culture for, um, because it was that culture that was destroyed in which everything split apart in diaspora, uh, and they took it to all the different parts of the world. Yeah, we get sort of two... I think um, sections of, of maybe even three sections of prehistory, if I can put it that way. Typically you have uh, from a biblical perspective an understanding that there's really one civilization, right? That branches out. Mm -hmm. But from what the other um, cultures and religions uh, and legends document is that there were uh, as many as four to nine civilizations, and some people even say more than that, um, that were around, and that would include civilizations like Atlantis or Sumeria, which was probably the one accounted for in, in the Bible with the descendants of, of Adam and Seth. Uh, and you have other ones that... Um, could be Thule, it could be Mu, could be so many other ones that are um, sort of the holdover archaeological sites that are underwater, uh, right. um, you know, let's say off the coast of India with Malahala Burton, I think I, I butchered that name, but Ma Malahala Burton, I think is it, very close to it anyways. Yeah, and then you've got them. these cities off, uh, off of Indonesia, and you've got all of these ancient cult cultures, but what has come out, and this comes out more out of theosophy in the last couple of hundred years, which is Gnosticism and New Age, is that they believe that there was a mother culture to that, which they've labeled Lemuria, which uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's certainly what they believe that started all of these other cultures. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot more things going on in prehistory before the flood than just the descendants uh, of Seth and 
whatever happened to uh, the Canaanites. There seems to be a lot more going on that they entered in over top of, so to speak. Right, right, exactly. Yes, um, it, in, in my research, I, I see that as well. And we have individuals like James Churchward, who speaks about and talks about this ancient Mu culture, you know, and whether that comes from Lemuria or, you know, there's all, all these um, analogies to this mother culture that being destroyed in our very distant past, that it seems to be the one of which the fallen angels and the giants and all the antediluvian cultures split off from, and then they went yeah. to the different parts of the world. Even in the Emerald and, and Tablets of Thoth, it speaks about yeah. you know how they went to Egypt as part of one of these branches. But go ahead, Gary. Yeah. Well, and it makes sense when you start to try and figure out what's going on with, with what's written in Genesis, and you have Cain, who is ostracized and goes right. to um, uh, the land of Nod and uh, starts to build a city. I mean, a city right. for who? There's only one, and he has a yes. wife instantly. <laughs> who? <laughs> and and the place has a name, and mm -hmm. you know, and even if um, they were going to settle there, it would be quite a few years before they um, would require a city. And right. typically, a city in the um, antediluvian age and in, in all throughout history is, is was created for protection with high walls. And so right. you get into all of these different things. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to measure all things uh, outside the Bible against what's written in the Bible. And I also like to uh, be just as much as a contrarian or verify things and understand things by checking out everything that the Bible says. And right. the only way I can sort of rationalize the the, the Cain story um, is with the understanding that I can't rationalize days four through six with the Eden account of Adam and Eve. They're two different stories. Yes. There are so many differences, order of creation and right. how Adam and Eve are created and on and on and on. I won't go through all of that. That's a show in itself. I have, uh, I have some documents if people wanted to get hold of me through my contacts that if you wanted to get the step-by-step um, differences between the two stories, um, I lay that all out for people. And what's important about all of that is, is that I don't believe the Bible contradicts itself. No, so that means not, not. only to me that there was two different creations. And I know that's right. controversial, but it's a heck of a lot easier than trying to uh, say how the writers of Genesis as the word of God got the details wrong. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, again, when you take into parallel account all of the other stories, that seems to exactly what, what is revealed within uh, the fullness of the story of humanity that you see in Genesis. And Gary's talking about the creation account, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and then Genesis 2, 4 through 7. Uh, and so, you know, and I do agree with him, these are two very different accounts. One shows the pre-Adamite pre pre humans being created as couples, male and female, and created on the earth and told to go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth, which, in my opinion, the, the story in Genesis 1 through 2 as well is showing that the earth was destroyed in some cataclysmic event. I believe it was the war in heaven. It led to the destruction even way back then. And what is the recreation of the earth for the second world age? And uh, all that is playing out as well as in background story for what is the pre-Adamic peoples and also for the creation of modern humanity. Can you comment on that, Gary? Oh, absolutely. And I'm not as dogmatic on um, the renewal of the earth and from the destruction of the earth, which uh, would take place in between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. Mm -hmm. um, but the angelic rebellion, in my opinion, fits much better there and yes. the world that was before than it does afterwards. But right. I'm not, as, as I say, as dogmatic on that one, because I know it, 
the translation as it comes down was a standard dogma that there isn't that gap in there or the renewal. Um, but, you know, I would point people to Psalm 104.30 where it says, you know, when God sends his spirit, the earth is renewed. Well, that sounds mm -hmm. an awful lot like Genesis 1-2. Right. And then you get into all the different ways you can, and um, you know, translate to who and boohoo and all the other differences where yes. you could tra easily translate that, that the word, that the earth became void and formless. And that, right. you know, in Isaiah 45, God doesn't create anything in vain. He creates things right. to live in. So yes. why would he create earth? And it was formless and void, not livable, right? That makes right. no sense. And again, right. I don't believe the, the Bible works that way. So although I, I'm fine with either translation, I think the angelic rebellion fits better there. And again, I have a couple of documents on that that walks everybody through that. If they want to get a hold of me, I can send it to you. Yes. And um, I think also it's uh, important to consider, like, there are, I found two um, places within the commentaries and also in the second book of Enoch, where it speaks about that the angelic rebellion took place in that area and that the angels were cast out of the heavens after the war in heaven on the second day. And so these seem to be confirming witness for that particular timeline. And then that would make sense that, you know, the earth being destroyed, that the war in heaven, the separation of light and darkness on day one, that we see uh, the earth, as you said, the word is Haya, uh, the Hebrew word Haya, and it means became or becomes. And so yes. I fully agree that God wouldn't just create the heavens um, formless and and void and or imperfect and incomplete and then have to all of a sudden you know finish when it says that he had created it uh you know as far as the first seven days and it was completed it doesn't make sense unless you think that uh and consider that something happened which led to it becoming uh what it says in the hebrew is a deserted wasteland and an indistinguishable ruin and ruin, yep. you know, implies that it was destroyed, as it says in uh, Jeremiah 4, verses 23 through 30. Yeah. And then it also answers the question in verse 28, why it says the word replenish. Right. If When when uh, humans are first created in, in day six, so why would you replenish? And I know a lot right. of people say, well, that word didn't mean plenish. It just means to, you know... Uh, fill and, and to multiply, but if you take that etymology back, no, it meant that at the time of the King James Version's writers. So that's just sort of uh, revisionist sort of history. And I don't believe the uh, that they put that word replenished in by mistake. I think they were very, very careful with the words for good or bad in some cases um, that the translators used. So and another interesting thing, and again, I'm not dogmatic on when dinosaurs had to roam the earth, was it um, after the renewal of the earth, as what we're talking about here, or was it in the age um, reigned over by, um, you know, the the angels before the war? That's so clearly also described in other religions, and particularly well in the Hindu religions with the destruction right. of the world with nuclear type weapons and things like that. And the reason why I say that is is that you know we have science telling us great ages on dinosaurs, perhaps true, perhaps not true, but that's what they're saying. And when I look at uh, having that gap between, uh, you know, verses one and two in Genesis one, then that could be a significant period in time, right? We right. have no idea how long that could be. And it would make sense, you know, if you look at the watcher angels, who I think are uh, the, the seraphim angels who uh, create the Nephilim because of the mostly serpentine look that we get of these angels right. coming down through uh, history and through scripture is that um, these are the seraphims out of Isaiah 6 who are the fiery serpent angels. And, you know, you put feathers and wings on them and you get a feathered or a plume serpent as in the uh, Kishamaya account of Quetzalcoatl and, and the other similar gods to him and uh, the Nagas out of uh, India. And, 
these are very much dinosaur type of beings, right? In terms of the, the yes. look, just the flying one with the wings. And right. now we learn that you know, over the last decade or so, maybe a little bit longer, that many of the scientists are saying, well, you know, the dinosaurs weren't all these just straight lizard type beings. Many of them had feathers. And again, right. it just sort of feeds into that was the world that they were running when they rebelled, right? Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, hold on, Gary. We're uh, at break, and so we'll pick it up on the other side and go into the issue of the feathered serpent because that is a fascinating topic, and it's one that um, you know people need to understand in connection to the antediluvian times and what is revealed in Genesis chapter 3 and also all of the seraphic serpentine allusions all throughout the Bible which are connected to the children of Cain and so we'll be right back everyone and uh, we'll pick it up on the other side all right I want to share this passage from the legends of the patriarchs and the prophets because it's very interesting, and it gives us something to consider with regard to uh, the angels copulating with the daughters of Cain. It says, After they had sinned, they were given bodies of flesh, for an angel who spends seven days on earth becomes opaque and substantial. And when they had been clothed with flesh and with a corrupt nature, then they spake the word, Shem Hamforash and sought to regain their former place but could not and were cast out into the mountains there to dwell from these angels descend the sons of the giants and the Anakim and from their seed also spring the devils in Rabbi Eliezer's book it says that the giants sprang from the union of the angels with the daughters of Cain who walked about in immodest clothing and cast their eyes around with bold glances. And the book of Zenarium in the Parash Sykoth says that Og sprang from this connection and that Samael, the angel, was the parent of Og, but that Sihon was the son of the same angel who deceived the wife of Ham when she was about to enter into the ark. And so... Um, just considering, you know, how the angels taking on physicality, that they were caught up in physicality. And in my opinion, it also speaks about this in Psalms 82, where it speaks about God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. It says, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are out of course, which in my opinion is connected to Genesis 1-2. But what is really important, it says, I have said, ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. And I think that prince is, you know, of course, Lucifer, who led the rebellion of one third of the angels. But I believe that the angels were also placed under the authority of death. Uh, Gary, do you have comment on that? Well, it's an interesting concept because it clearly says that they're going to die like men in Psalms 82. Right. And right. and these are uh, the angelic beings. And again, once you get in behind the English, you find out that all of the words are interrelated as, as, as angels and are the same terminologies as being used in the sons of God in Genesis 6. Right. But they're created, immo but they're created immortal. Yes. Um, but yet somehow they're going to die. So that means they may be immortal, but their life is still controlled by God somehow. And maybe um, as some traditions uh, say that the angels were created in the smokeless fire, they are also destroyed by that type of fire, which is the lake of fire. So, mm -hmm, right. um it's, and it's, I mean, I, I can't say for certain that that's, you know, but I'm just sort of connecting some dots on that. Yes, yes. But this idea that, you know, a lot of people think that, well, there's no way that you can take Genesis 6, 1 through 4 literally because there's no way spiritual beings can take a, a form uh, of, you know, physical nature and then somehow have sex and 
and, and reproduce. Well, uh, I think Genesis 6 sort of uh, speaks uh, directly to that and says that they can. Yes, And exactly. that we have many accounts of angels throughout the Bible. And they come in many different shapes and forms. And you get, you know, uh, in Genesis with Abraham, uh, you get men. Um, they look like men. And they have a physical form. And they eat. And they do everything, and I think also in the physical form, if they can take that physical form, which it seems that they can with the accounts in the Bible, that it makes sense they would be affected by the physical world and tempted by the physical world, which may have made it easier or uh, the temptation for them to reproduce and, and violate, uh, you know, a significant law of creation. And in, um, in Sodom, they recognize these angels as men. And I'm going to come back right. to that in a, in, a, in a second. But we also get, you know, the forms of the seraphim that we talked about as mm. the fiery serpent looking angels. And you get these giant shining beings um, in uh, Daniel and ones that can put their foot on a continent and on an ocean. And you've got, as I say, just many, many different descriptions of angels having a physical form in this world and so when i look at jude 1 6 and i look at they left their habitation um right. habitation goes back to oikaterian which is a dwelling place for the spirit so you connect that back up with second corinthians 5 and you get that same word oikaterian talking about when it's talking about uh, the place in heaven and uh, the types of bodies, their spiritual bodies and, and, terrestrial, uh, and terrestrial bodies, that they have the ability to create a dwelling place for um, their spirit in this physical world. And so I think that when we look at all the different um, verses that are used in the Old Testament, whether or not it's host of heaven and it is angels and stars and uh, sons of God. Uh, they all use each other, those words in reference in other passages to tell you they're all the same being. So these sons of God aren't Sethites. Uh, the Bible testifies right. over and over and over who they are. And they say that they produced giants, not seven feet tall people but giants and they had these spectacular you know abilities that went along with their size so i think we need to take at face value that um, they had that ability to do that and when i link that now back to sodom in jude again as that verse goes on it, it seems like the people there knew that the angels could have sex and, and reproduce because they're asking to have sex with these two angels. Yes. And whether or not it's homosexual sex or it is that they know that they have the ability to change into an opposite sex or they're going to have the these two males have sex with females. I think they're actually talking as much, you know, other than the, the perversion everybody associates with it, as recreating more Raphaim in Sodom. And I think that's also part of why it's such a large destruction. And Second Peter, you know, as they're, they're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood and the, and the angels and that whole narrative, it is also referencing this absolutely disgusting conversation that's going on. And right. because it's, they're, they're suggesting that they break the, the laws of creation again there. So we have many, many accounts without getting into too much minutia uh, on the details that this is the case and that these were immortal beings, but yet somehow, some way, God still maintains as the greatest being there is an unimaginable power and scope and knowledge and goodness and love. He has the ability to take that life away, even from an immortal. And it seems to right. me with that strong fire that they were created with. Yeah, so I think that's exactly what Scripture relates and speaks about. And however they took on physicality, that and whether you know, like you know, even though they're under the authority of death, I don't think they are snuffed out or annihilated or until the lake of fire, the second death. But they have to 
uh, in order to to in, interact in the physical world, I believe they have to possess bodies in some manner. Exactly. Yeah. In and some so, manner, either a creation right. or as in the uh, uh, the Hindu uh, religions where they avatar um, mm -hmm. uh, exactly, yes. a person. Just as Satan, uh, you know, right. you could say he avatars Judas, or perhaps he avatared Nakash as well to right. um, deceive Eve. So, I mean, that's not an unknown concept. And just as the demon spirits need to possess, which is a different concept than avatar or avatara, um, to interact in the world. And as Jesus describes, they're in the desert, and it's like they're thirsting um, and are desperate to possess a body to interact in the world because being spiritual, um, I guess you don't have the same sort of senses that you do in the physical world. Right, right. And then in Jude, which we had brought up, it says in verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so the fornication and going after strange flesh is what brought about their their judgment and their condemnation. And we see in the book sure. of Enoch, they they made they knew that they were going to be condemned and judged and punished uh, just severely, and yet they made a pact to go ahead and do it anyways. They did. And what's interesting about when you use that term strange flesh and you take that back to the Greek, it means species, a different kind, a different race. This is right. not talking about, um, and then it's such odd language to be using too. When you read that, you go strange flesh. What's right. that talking about? <laughs> I mean, it just pops out that there's more meaning to that as to what they're talking about. And then having that connected to the crimes of the angels and that comparative at Sodom, I think is uh, a direct correlation that uh, they were trying to, they're having a conversation about violating that same sexual act. And it also may represent uh, the idea that the Rephaim after the flood uh, are recreated at Sodom and or again at, uh, at Mount Hermon, because you could you could interpret that sort of both ways if, if you go for the second incursion theory of how giants show up after the flood. To me, that's where I would put my bets as either at Sodom or at, uh, at Mount Hermon again. Yeah, definitely within that area, you know, the, the 60 cities of under control of Aga Bashan, certainly Goliath and his brothers and all, a lot of the other giant uh, families and tribes are coming out of and from that particular area, and so I, yep. I do. Uh, I do want to talk. And, and you're, about, and you're, go ahead. I just, go ahead. I just going to say, and you're familiar. And I know you're familiar with the tablets of Seth, right? Um, as a, out of the yes. uh, out of the Dead Sea Scrolls and and the uh, the Canaanites and the Sethites and the various branches of of the Gnostic sex sex, but they say. Um, they have a, a couple of verses in there where it's talking about Amaka Seth, who has his first incarnation at Sodom and then is replanted in the second incarnation at Gomorrah and will be again in an incarnation uh, in, in the end time. And so, for, again, from context, from their perspective, they look at that area as somehow that's how that race of giants shows up after the flood. Mm hmm Right. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, going back, and I do want to touch upon uh, the Lost Book of Og, especially for those that have not heard about and, you know, read this particular text. And I'll open it with this passage um, in, from the Baruch chapter 3, verse 10 in the Slavonic version. It says, and the angel said to me, rightly you asked me, when God made the flood upon the earth, he drowned every firstling, and he destroyed 104,000 giants. And the waters rose above the mountains, 20 cubits above the mountains, and the water entered into the garden, bringing out one shoot from the vine as God withdrew the waters. 
in a Greek translation of the same text, it says, and the angel said, rightly you ask, when God caused the flood over the earth and destroyed all flesh, he killed 409,000 giants, and the water rose over the heights 15 cubits. The water entered paradise and killed every flower, but it removed the sprig of the vine completely and brought it outside. And that's Baruch 4. And so we see from these two passages that there were a huge amount of giants, um, you know, especially with as much as immense and as large as these pre-flood giants were said to be that, um, and then, you know, humanity being eaten by them, as I read in the opening quote, um, but that in this particular book on the lost book of Og, the Rephaim king, it speaks about a hundred thousand giant war and so in my opinion uh we see that you know that was the result of uh the angels after they making their pact that god sends the four angels to lead the giants against each other to decimate them and the angels that created the the giants out of their fornication with the daughters of cain they are forced to watch the slaughter of their children and that the flood was more specific, a sentence and a judgment against the fallen angels and the giants that were born uh, out of you know unholy matrimony and unnatural recourse um, than it was for humanity, even though most of humanity had fallen the way of Cain. And by the time of Noah, there were only eight righteous souls and Noah being only pure in his generations. And so can you comment on that? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a, a fairly uh, good, yes, yeah, so it's a big sweep. And, you know, what we do know is that uh, there was a lot of giants that were before the flood. How many, we don't know, but in uh, account says what you're citing, um, you know, as many as 400,000, 409,000 were killed. There could have been even more than that because they were right. around for hundreds of years and they were known to have harems of women yes. um, that they would uh, reproduce with, um, which uh, we'll probably talk a little bit about, you know, later in terms of um, where they go wrong in that direction, at least according mm -hmm. to the Book of Og. Yes. But you know, the war that you're talking about is a hundred thousand giant giants that are brought from the four corners of the earth, so to speak, and uh, all of all different races and variety and looks. And when I'm talking about races, I'm talking more than just color. I'm talking about different kinds of Nephilim, yes. right? That right. have different looks. Um, and they're brought from all over the earth. And this war is being fought while the flood is uh, going to eventually wipe them all out. Um, right. They're trying to kill each other because it's a war between seemingly Rephaim and Nephilim. And Nephilim are seemingly distinct from Rephaim um, and or have intermixed with humans. Uh, I, you know, I, when I read the Book of Og, I get kind of get both feelings that there are they were uh, just the ones that rebelled, but I mean, the, the word is so distinct that I think that they were maybe a different branch uh, of giants and Og yes. is part of the Rephaim branch. And how, you know, when I match that up with the Bible, you know, with Nephilim, you only get that word to feel with I am as the male plural um, three times in the Old Testament, Genesis 6, 4. Numbers 13.33, where it says in the King James Version Bible, uh, the Anak are the descendants of giants. Giants go back to Neph Nephilim, just as it does in Genesis 6.4. All other words that use giant uh, in the Old Testament go back to Rapha, um, and Raphaim is the male plural, suggesting there's something distinct and different, because one would think that if they weren't different somehow, the, um, whether or not it's it's uh, it's as being as large, or they're not don't have the immortal spirit, or don't have as many powers, or downgraded from the ones before before the flood, um, if indeed they're created after the flood, um, that they're distinct somehow is is sort of my 
my my point on that. Yes. And so when we start to understand the size and the nature of this narrative of giants before the flood, that they are the cause of the flood, that uh, not only are they have they turned against humankind, they're turned against each other as well. And it is more than just the violence going on. I think they've corrupted with their knowledge and their technology the whole earth. And when you look at that word shakath as corrupt in the flood story, um, that means ruin, decay, uh, you know, wreck. It is more than just violence. The giants were certainly causing violence, and certainly as this book of Og will talk about, but I think they corrupted uh, the uh, the plant genome, and I think they corrupted the animal genome. And when you hear about some of these beasts and things in prehistory around the world and in the book of Og that we'll talk about tonight, is that I think that's what this corruption is all about, so that when the Bible literally says the whole world was corrupt, we have to think of it in a larger scale than violence. Yeah, absolutely. I, I fully agree. Uh, and in the, the book of giants in the found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says the miscegenation of all things, including plants and animals. And specifically, it makes mention of plants as well. And so somehow, in some manner, they corrupted all things genetically. And, um, and I think, you know, that's, again, one of the reasons why the Most High had to bring in upon a flood in order to wipe out everything killed all that was living and uh, allowed the earth to replenish itself in a manner that was um, you know more towards the natural order and harmony of things as the way that they were initially established uh, by uh, the father yeah and again as we talked about earlier it's why you we need to understand prehistory for yes. a number of reasons um, it's nothing new is under the sun and everything is just sort of repeating itself. And so this happens again in the end time. And in terms of how they corrupted the earth, um, I think it, they had very advanced technology and science as that uh, were developed through the secret societies and the mystical religions as the Freemasons and the Gnostics and the Rosicrucians believe. Um, and they developed these sciences to a great level, but at the time, when you have the the watchers mating with human females to create the Nephilim, they're also providing additional illicit knowledge that accelerates the knowledge at an unprecedented uh, pace, just as what we're seeing today. And when I look at what Jesus says, and I like to place all prophecy around what Jesus said um, first, not vice versa. Right. I look at uh, one of the major signs for the fig tree generation is um, it'll be like the days of Noah. And right. of course, Noah lived 600 right. years before right. the flood, 350 years after. So I think we have to look at both sides, but in particularly what was going on in the days of Noah. And that if uh, giants had an effect back then, they'll probably have, a giant, uh, have an effect back as we go into in, into the end time, and if we're not yet in the end time, even though I think it's on the horizon, and our technology hasn't yet hit its peak, and it's going to be like the days of Noah, that would suggest to me that their knowledge was greater than what we have right now, although we may be closing in on it. And again, I know it says in Matthew 24 and the parallel prophecies in Mark and Luke that it's talking about the violence. But again, we have to look bigger than the violence, as I talked about in terms of the corruption, and that um, people will not be expecting uh, the end to come because they'll think uh, Antichrist is the Christ and the Messiah has come, and they're actually in the millennium. That's part of the counterfeit of the right. deception. But this is part of the overall signs, and we have to understand that the signs of Noah are part of the end time signs. So we need to look at it in that smaller context and in the larger context as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very important sign. And it's something that is, again, you have to understand the context of where and what things were with regard to before the flood, right before, you know, as far as the fallen angels and the giants, their presence and their interdiction 
on the world stage to really make sense of what Christ is alluding to there. And I think, as yeah. you may mention, that not only was the technology far superior than what we are even at right now, and that a lot of that is being recreated, which was lost in the flood of Noah's day, but um, that there's, you know, again, the supernatural presence of beings and races and hybrid creatures, which are no longer found on the earth, but part of the mythological uh, accounts of people worldwide. And that we'll see again, uh, the unfolding of that veil and that spiritual world coming in upon uh, this material world and those kind of things coming to the yeah. coming to light. Yeah, and and to add to to that, and in terms of understanding what Jesus was trying to tell us, is is if now we overlay the Luke version on the Matthew and Mark version. Luke actually connects the days of Noah sign um, with Sodom and Gomorrah. And with the sins created there as being the same types of sexual violations and what is, you know, caused the flood as part of the signs of what the end time are going to be. And again, as we talked about uh, earlier, Sodom could be a location where you have that violation happen after the flood. And again, I have a document on that. If people want that, just get a hold of me and I'll, I'll walk through the step by step scripture. Um, Hold on, roadmap okay. for putting those dots together. All right. Hold on, everyone. We'll be right back for a second hour. And now to you, the holy ones of heaven, the souls of men make their suit, saying, Bring our cause before the Most High. And they said to the Lord of the ages, Lord of lords, God of gods, King of kings, and God of the ages, the throne of thy glory, standeth unto all the generations of the ages, and thy name holy and glorious and blessed unto all the ages. Thou hast made all things and power over all things hast thou, and all things are naked and open in thy sight, and thou seest all the things, and nothing can hide itself from thee. And so this is where judgment is brought upon the fallen angels for all that they did and the lawlessness that they released upon the earth and judgment again was brought upon them that the angels were then tasked by the most high to go down and to lead the giants in war with one another and so in the lost book of og which is a text that was released in 2016 in which not a lot of people are very aware of, and of course, neither Gary or I are saying that it's scriptural, uh, but it is interesting read, and it certainly gives a viewpoint on some of the aspects of the giant wars, which are little spoken about and little understood. And we see, I believe, what is an elaboration of this particular sentence that was placed upon them, and that uh, we have Og against Nimrod, and that one faction of the giants are uncircumcised, and another faction of the giants circumcised and seem to be more friendly towards humanity, whereas Og and his people, they kept human humanity as slaves and also raised them as food crop, you know, much like cattle and uh it's interesting also that within these this particular text on this giants wars we see that the magic and the possessions that they are involved with uh, the different elements bale of the earth bale of the moon bale of the sun uh that there are different elementary m magics that they specialize in and that as gary had made mention of earlier that initially what brought uh, about their destruction and an end to their bloodlines was that the women died out amongst them and that Og was married to the last of the woman and she had borne 
what was called the moon child. And this moon child was supposedly going to be the savior of their race. And yet the war between them even led to her death. And so, Gary, can you uh, comment on this and uh, speak about what you know we were talking about previously? You know, a lot of people, when um, they get a hold of me, they say, why isn't there anything spoken about females uh, in terms of giants? And there's not a lot. Uh, and certainly we don't get a lot spoken of giants in the Bible before the flood. We get like four verses, right. <laughs> Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Um, but they were known as, you know, Titandes or Tentaides, as some people also call them. Um, in the Greek mythology, we know they're written about in terms of demigods. Uh, all throughout mythology, demigods are uh, the, the giants, the Nephilim. Uh, after the flood, we get a few names. Uh, Timna would be one that marries Amalek. She's the son of Seir, and Seir actually goes back to Satir in, um, in, in Hebrew, and, and Seir is a Horim, which is a division of the Raphaim. And so there are female names, but what's going on in the context of this story uh, about uh, what I believe is, is uh, I think what they would, what they call the unforgivable or unspoken uh, mistake Right. Um, and although when I read the book, it could also be also making um, a, a partnership with the, the humans, as some of the Rephaim do and the Nephilim do. But uh, what happens is that these beings are so corrupted uh, as time goes on in the antediluvian world that uh, the human nature takes over is what. Uh, the polytheist uh, accounts tend to talk about that evil now starts to possess them in all sorts of ways and pride and vanity takes over. So to feed that vanity, they would war with each other and kill each other and they would kill all of the wives of the harem that belonged to the giants that they killed so that they were doing, I guess, basically ethnic cleansing, so to speak, so that their bloodlines would be the ones that would uh, reign. And that's, again, follow that line of thought throughout history and what they're going to do in the end time, because that's what these descendants uh, are, are doing. And so they get down to a point where uh, uh, Lesta is, is the last female Raphaim, and that she does have the moon child, but and that's going to be the savior. But unfortunately, Nimrod kidnaps uh, them, and and uh, she ends up dying, and uh, so they're not able to reproduce anymore with female um, purebreds. So now the only way that they could reproduce thereafter would be is with human females. Right. Right, exactly. And then, you know, with the human females being a very smaller stature, um, many of them could only mate with them when they were younger. And by the time they got of larger size, they, you know, the, the female women, uh, the human female women could not survive um, the fornication. And so, you know, eventually their lines were doomed. And I think God really... He meant that to happen because of their, again, their haughtiness, their arrogance, their pride, um, and it just, you know, that he was against them as well. And so, um, but that seems to be what the story is revealing to us, which is an interesting aspect to the whole narrative and uh, gives us, you know, a fuller understanding as to why they would die out and... Um, so yeah, I mean, because part of the story, and and they eventually they would run out of food and humans right, to eat, right? right? Because yes. their appetites were just so huge, um, you know. Because these just weren't, you know, ten foot giants back then. I mean, right. Depending on how large you want to take them to, a lot of people think twenty to forty feet, um, and that sort of lines up with that level of the waters that you were talking about in terms of the cubits. 
um, that you had quoted from, but some people think they were even bigger. And in and there's two versions of the Book of Enoch in the translations. There's the Aramaic version from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the one that was found a little earlier through the Ethiopians and the Giaz version, which is a little bit longer. One says 300 cubits and one says 300 L's. And uh, so I don't think they were 450 feet tall, um, if you're, you know, or uh, maybe even a little taller than that. Um, going on 18 inches, well, it'd be 450 feet tall, but if it's a royal cubit, they would be even taller because that was almost 21 inches. So I don't think they were that big, and perhaps L's is the actual word that is the measurement, but we just don't know how big an L was. But what we do know is, is they would be at least um, 20 to 40 feet tall. And I, you know, I also go to, even though this is after the flood, with Amos 2.1, where it says that they're like, which is a simile, uh, the uh, cedars of Lebanon, and those trees grew from 36 to 50 feet, and they were the giant trees of the ancient world that they used to build all the great temples and things with. And uh, so I know that's a simile, and they're talking about Amorites, um, but uh, who are a hybrid version of the Raphaim, in, in my opinion, is how I understand how the tables of nations unfold after the flood. Um, but it gives you an idea that these weren't seven or eight feet tall or 10 feet tall, and which means if they were that huge, then their appetites would have matched. And right. who knows how that sort of multiplies in terms of the energy that it takes to keep those bodies moving and mobile and warm and functioning. Yeah, um, you know, just recently I saw... An an interesting study uh, that J Dreamers had done on the words and the 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 original um, Hebrew as far as Og's bedstead, and it was interesting because he was talking about and looking at and examining the context of those passages, and it seems to be alluding to that Og's bedstead that it was like his uh, his baby crib. And that it was that size, and so Og could very much have been larger in stature. But, anyways, uh, we see in the book of Jasher that it speaks about him as very much larger stature, and that um, when Moshe killed him, he was only able to strike him in his ankle, but that he had picked up a, a mountain that was so large that it could have killed you know many of what was then israel gathered against him but that the angel split the mountain and it fell upon his neck and that was part of um you know what brought him to the ground in order that moshe would slay him and we see that god did in the the book of joshua that he fought against the giants and that um you know, the, the people were concerned because of their stature and their mightiness, but that God was fighting for them and that he was uh, responsible yeah. for the slaughter of many. But go ahead. Well, and I think that goes to then the argument was Og a being that was created after the flood or did he survive the flood? Right. Um, and as the book of Og says, uh, he survived the flood. And again, yes. it's not scripture. Um, and we don't have scripture to, to tell us uh, how Og was born or whether or not he survived the flood. But, you know, he, he show, certainly shows up after the flood. So, but my point is, if he's an antediluvian giant, then he would be much bigger than the description in that bed because. Uh, that bed would place him and again. I would use a royal cubit because these were all kings. Um, that bed would have been between 15 to 16 feet long, as opposed to the standard sort of 14 to 14 and a half feet that a lot of people like to use in terms of the cubits that are quoted. Um, and it was made of iron to, to hold his weight because they were, you know, right. a lot wider. People think that uh, uh, conclude crush. that they were. 
yeah, that that it would crush the wood, and their bodies uh, were had a height to width ratio of two to one compared to humans, which would be three to one. So they were like fifty percent wider. So not only bigger but muscular as well. Right. So it's quite it's quite interesting on that. And the Bible has some very very interesting language in terms of its reference to to King Og as being the last of the Rephaites, or the last of the survivors right. of the Rephaim. And that's very, very, very odd language uh, if he was created after the flood. And understand my, I say this with my f most favored position being second incursion, as opposed to survival somehow on an ark or with the help of angels or in the earth or whatever, because it just sort of fits better with some of uh, the verses, but I'm open to both. But my favorite present position is second incursion. Having said that, it makes no sense to say he's the last of the Rephaim because uh, this Og is killed along with his brother Sihon before Joshua leads the armies across the Jordan and the covenant land is filled in with Rephaim branches of people, including around Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and, you know, not actually those cities because those are destroyed, but in that region, as well as the Anakim, which are a branch of the Rephaim, as Deuteronomy 2 says. And um, they are you know, living in, Rephaim are living in the covenant land, just as the Emin were in Moab and the Zamzazim were in, um, in, in the Jordan region, Ammon. And so they couldn't be the last of the Rephaim because Joshua and his armies were going to fight against these Rephaim beings and Rephaim hybrids that they right. intermarried with and started other tribes with. Right. And so uh, what I think it's either saying, it can only be saying one of two things. They're the last of the original born in the second incursion after the flood, or they survived the flood somehow. And there are lots of accounts that, uh, particularly in, in, the, in the Gnostic versions of Og surviving the flood, and in, one, and in Jewish uh, legend where uh, they kind of come together where he's hanging on to the, uh, some sort of netting or ropes on the ark. And as, uh, as the ark is sailing away and uh, Noah feeds them until after the flood. So there's a stories that say that he also survived the flood just as Og is, survives the flood in the, in the book of Og. So again, bringing it back to what scripture says um, and also underlining that we don't have a smoking gun verse as to how these giants show up after the flood. Right. Uh, in the Targum, it, it says this of Og. It says in uh, Genesis chapter 14, And Og came who had been spared from the giants that died in the deluge and had ridden protected upon the top of the ark and sustained with food by Noah, not being spared through high righteousness, but that the inhabitants of the world might see the power of, of the Lord and say, were there not giants who in the first times rebelled against the Lord of the world and perished from the earth? Um, and I would also add that the Perk, the Rabbi Eleazar, and also the legends of the patriarchs and the prophets um, say that same thing, that you know, Og was the last remnant giant that he had ridden on top of the ark in some manner. And and that yep. that would be you know why he survived. But um, and but what's again, interesting again, what's interesting again about that is, Og also has a brother that's also mentioned in the Book right. of Og and in the Bible named right. Sihon. Sihon. And yes. we and we're not and we're not told how he shows up after the flood as a brother. Right, right, right. exactly. Because if Og is the last remnant, then you know how does he just somehow show up you know he couldn't have been born afterwards because who would be yeah. born to you know so yeah so they're either both created after the flood or both survived the flood right that's right, the only right. thing that makes sense uh, yeah right exactly oh and also since we are making mention as far as the the lost book of king og and that the war was between og and nimrod it's both gary and i's contention that 
there was a giant who was called Nimrod, which is a title, the rebellious one, and that the Nimrod that most people are familiar with who uh, created the Tower of Babel and united the people after the flood of Noah's day, that these were two separate individuals, not the same, because otherwise it would be yeah. confusing. It gets very confusing, and it's the only way to sort of make sense of it. And right. again, I like again I like to take my arguments back to other scriptural um, basis, so that we're just not totally speculating. Yeah, uh, we are speculating, but we're speculating with a little bit of uh, uh, research behind it. So it's not unusual to have names of people named after giants and or, or angels right. in, in, in the Bible. And probably right. the best example uh, that I can think of is uh, uh, the descendants of Japheth. Um, and uh, that's Gog and Magog. And in uh -huh. Greek mythology, um, Poseidon and Iapetus are the same god. And they have the same story and what in similar and similar sort of names, but they produce Gog and Magog and Albion uh, as part of the uh, of Poseidon Iapetus' sons, just as Atlas and the, the kings of the Atlantean Empire are also sons of Poseidon and right. uh, created all through human females. And it's the people of Japheth that move into the Scythia region, you know, that we were talking about briefly last night in terms of where these titans, heroes, giants from Greek mythology show up after the flood and create the dragon bloodlines and uh, that intermix into the Tartaria, right. um, hidden history of things that people haven't really explored a lot into, um, that, that sense of Japheth um, intermarry uh, with these people um, in the Turkey region, in the Scythian region, and take on what I think names of giants as in Gog and Magog. And there are more examples like that um, in terms of, of these names kind of, kind of showing, showing up. And, you know, there's a name of Saul that comes from the Horim um, in uh, Genesis 36 that King Saul takes. I mean, this, this goes on more than what people would, would suggest, but that would be a couple of examples as to, it wouldn't be unusual for somebody to be named after a giant. Right, right. Um, and even Og, he's said to have a son named Augius, which a lot of people get confused with him as well um, and believe him to be the same character yeah. as King Og. And so, yeah, it, it gets confusing and all the, the bloodlines and all the stories, but it is interesting to look at and examine all these different parallels to get a better understanding you know, better overlook and overview of the, the fullness of the story, because I think it's fascinating. Um, and want to make mention really quickly also, for those that are not familiar with the Lost Book of King Og, it's interesting in the wars between them that they use very ancient animals and that they are able to fuse with their creatures that they seem to be uh, using what are dinosaur type animals um, even before the flood you know that these creatures didn't exist afterwards but you know those kind of stories certainly give it a Lord of the Rings type feel and so fascinating read in my opinion oh it's riveting um, whether or not it's 100% uh, accurate or not it's a, it's a riveting uh, read and uh, actually Og you know in his army in the 100,000-man war brings in these beasts and rides on these beasts as part of his entry into the into that battle. Right. And, uh, you know, you've, you've got significant references to these dinosaur and great beasts or and or possibly corrupted creations in the right. antediluvian world all right. throughout um, uh, the Book of Og. So... There, there are, uh, like I say, interesting little tidbits that just set your mind to, to motion. Um, but it's also, I think we should put out, uh, you know, a qualification, though. Make sure you're firmly 
um, assured and 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 are basing everything in, on scripture before you Absolutely. go into reading this stuff so that you can keep things uh, in, in, in context. Right. Absolutely. First and foremost, always um, get your base, your truth and your faith on the, the foundation of the canonical materials. And then when reading and studying this extra biblical material, always parallel it with that. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, you should be grounded in the scriptures and know them before moving forward into other areas, other avenues. But doing that certainly it's an interesting read studying this other other material it, it is and you know i and and as as we talk about some of the details in in this book and um we should probably you know sort of mention for the audience that uh whether or not it is uh totally accurate or totally uncorrupted as it's come down through history uh, it does have a bit of a chain of history and it you know, the copy that we've got out today comes out of a larger book of the Manichaean giants from the Vatican and why they released it. We're not 100% sure why, but probably right. to start getting some of this information out before we get right into into the last days. Um, but it connects back as the Manichaean book of giants back to a book that you call, that you were talking about earlier that comes out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, right. the uh, e Enoch book of giants that there are just fragments of, but some very interesting fragments that, that are out there. Um, and that, uh, this en Enochian book of giants from the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Manichaean version seems to have meshed with um, a Persian version that includes a few different names here and there, but essentially they're telling the same type of story. Um, and this o book of Og section is, is one section of that larger book. Um, so it does have some history. And of course, the Enoch Book of Giants has its history that goes back to Enoch 1 and 2. Right. And I, I would also add that the, the dream vision that the giants have um, in the Book of Giants, as well as the Monachian uh, Book of Giants, it fits right along with the Book of Enoch in that they apply to him to go before the Most High to ask them, you know, uh, so that he could represent them. And then he interprets their dreams and lets them know that destruction is coming. Uh, uh, we'll be right back, everyone, for the final segment. All right, welcome back, everybody, for final segment. Um, your host, Zen Garcia, this is Secrets of Field, here on Truth Frequency Radio, and Gary Wayne and I are speaking about the ancient giant wars and the origin of the uh, the sons of Anak uh, and from as far as the interdiction of the Nephilim with the daughters of Cain. But um, all of this is very interesting because as we brought up and made mention of before, Christ said in when the apostles asked him what would be specifically the signs for his return and of the end of the age uh, to make mention of as in the days of Noah, which we are equating to and elaborating on with regard to the the giants and their presence and uh, their destruction with the flood that a lot of mainstream churches don't even teach this aspect of what was the reason for the flood coming upon the earth. And then I know also that a lot of the, especially the, the newer churches, they only really like to read from and to study from the New Testament. And so not reading or understanding the Old Testament, they completely miss the mention of the giant wars and even of how um, when the Most High released uh, the Israelites from the bondage of Egypt that going into Canaan land that this was the presence of the giants was what they had feared and that the Most High elevated his name and he as being the one true God um, 
over the idols of Egypt and Babylon and all of the other pantheon of gods and goddesses, which are nothing more than the angels parading as if they are God wanting to be like the Most High. But they are, in fact, created beings, um, and much like humanity, even though they are immortal and initially, um, but still they are created beings and they're, you know, never really had a chance um, in their trying to overthrow God. But, you know, Lucifer, in his pride and his arrogance, he led a third astray in believing him and giving them the promises of Godhood. And so that's why we find ourselves where we are now, that we are at the seeming the climax of this particular story, uh, which is a supernatural story and a spiritual uh, story of war in heaven coming down to the earth, the enmity between the sea lines, and what we see as the contest between the New World Order elites and the rest of humanity. And so uh, one story from beginning to end. Gary? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, again, one of the principles in terms of how I understand and interpret the Bible is is it's a linear story, Genesis to Revelations, um, and it unfolds in a linear, straightforward narrative manner. And where it doesn't, let's say in the Book of the Prophets, you get an understanding of uh, the timing and the kings and stuff, so you can take that back to the linear story of the kings and chronicles so that you can see where it fits in. And just as in Revelations, uh, where it doesn't appear to be linear, It'll have the marker, let's say, in Revelation 14, where it has a summary of the events right at the end, so you get the details that follow. So keep things simple, makes it easier to, to understand, and include all of the passages is another one of my, my rules when it comes to prophecy. Right. And so when we do that, it leads you back into understanding um, as we've talked about a few times today, what happened in the past so that we can be ready for um, the end time. And, uh, uh, you know, and one, you know, a classic example would be the Gog Magog War. Um, I mean, that comes right out of prehistory. And as we said, those were also names of giants. And so it's important to, it's important to understand the, these things and dig uh, as deeply as, as you can in, into it so that you can have a better anticipation as to what's coming because even as learned as you can get to be, I think we're still going to be shocked at the size of the deception and the things that we're going to see in the end time. Right, right. What was it, um, Gary, that initially piqued your interest, um, and what got you to really read? And you know, as far as Genesis six, what led you to that? Did you just decide to uh, read on your own, doing research that you were led to that? Uh, how was it, and what what led you to it? When I was young, and even as I was coming back to God in the in the early 80s, I, I was always a history buff, and I was always a mythology buff. And so when I started to get the bug for prophecy as well, um, I didn't realize that they were going to come together at, at a particular point in time. Mm -hmm. But when I decided to see whether or not because I have about 15 prophecy books I'd like to like to write. And, uh, <laughs> so I don't know whether I'll get them all done or not, but that that's kind of the plan. And so yeah. I needed to write a story to see if I could write, uh, number one, and two, you know, if I could get it published, and three, would people buy that book? So I thought right. what I want to do is write a very short book, and just to see and test all of that stuff out and learn the things that I needed to learn. And so I thought, um, I'm going to somehow connect Genesis 6 with end time prophecy because I know you got all of these strange beings in Revelation and you've got angels and you've got demons and all sorts of things. And I think I can write a short book and, and connect it back. And then I decided after I wrote the first 10 chapters, which was pretty fast, that I knew that all of the stuff that I'm talking about with the giants, I know of through mythology, right? 
Greek uh -huh. mythology uh, and uh, mythology all around the world. So I thought, well, let's add that in. And then I thought, well, I need to have the context of the mythology and the legends. I need to understand the religion. So I, now I need to learn that. And so I had to learn to read the Vedas and the Upanishads and uh, uh -huh. the Popol Vuh and on and on and on so that I could get a better context so I understood what, what they were talking about. And then that led me into the mystery schools, which all of a sudden led me into how they're connected to the secret societies and that all of them take their beginnings back to prehistory in Genesis 6 and the fallen angels and Enoch, son of Cain. And so what turned out to be this short little project to see whether or not I could get published <laughs> or not turned out to be a, you know, a 12 year uh, writing of a book that I thought might take me six months. <laughs> uh, yeah. Fascinating how that happens. Uh. Well, once you go down the rabbit holes, right. there's just so much, there's just so much there and you could continue to research forever and never right. actually get anything done. So yeah. Uh, or published and so at some point in time you just have to cut it off and right. as you're just finding learning more of the right. same story i guess is right. the best way of looking at it that's that's exactly what my conclusion i i found that you know with regard to one rabbit trail or one particular topic or one particular book that at some point you just have to abandon it and release it as it is and then move on to another theme and a the topic otherwise you know like even with your book, it, it's literally a library of material, 800 plus pages. I mean, it is a wealth of information and something that you could have easily made, you know, three, four part series out of. Yep. Well, uh, and I actually wrote it that way in anticipation of being unknown. Um, so very high risk that way and also high cost that they could split it into two, three or right. five books. Uh -huh. um, but each uh, each of the publishers and the first publisher went bankrupt 30 days before it was to hit the market. Oh my goodness! Um, so I had to start. I had to start. I had to start all over. Um, but each of them, after reading it, um, decided no, we can't split it up because they were looking at geez, if we did it in a trilogy or something, you know, everybody will do a lot better monetarily. But they said no. That came to the same conclusion that it needed to be told as one story, uh -huh. and uh, so. Then I knew it was a really good idea that I had edited out uh, over 300 pages because <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it, it would have been just too big as one story to 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 publish. So you ever uh, thought about just? Uh, I mean, do you have that all compiled together? And never thought about uh, releasing that as a Genesis six, um, you know, add-on or something of that nature, or you know. Yeah, the uh, the unedited sort of portion of it. Yeah, I thought yeah. about that. Um, um, that and would I do be have really it. cool. Yeah, I have it on digital and I have it on printed copy. So, yeah, because there's information that I go back in that I know that's not in my book, and and I know where it is in the larger digital copy, so I can find it fairly quickly. So, uh -huh. you and know, I and there's other things you know fans would be interested in in seeing and reading that material you know yeah well they they do see a lot of it coming out in some of my commentaries that aren't in 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 my book too so yeah. but yeah i could put it together and the publisher wants me to do to do a sequel as well but uh -huh. i want to do this other one first before right. i even think about uh, about a sequel so right. um so got to get the next book done before i can do the third book so that's, yes, yes. that's where i need to, to get some more discipline on it mm -hmm. um and again i mean even you know when you get into like reading like the book of Og, and it gives you all of these right. ideas yes. that you can now go start researching. And if you wanted to do that, I mean, it's just, and, and every time you read something, it's like that. Right. You know, one of the things in the book of Og that I found absolutely stunning was is all the different names of some of these giants yes. that come around right. the world. And I'm thinking, how do these names show up in the book of Og? Um, because this is supposed to be kind of closed societies, not big communication, but they've got all these other names that are inexplicably in, 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 in this book. So either they went in later or 
it's got a little bit more historical veracity to it, uh, or they had more knowledge than uh, we thought of when they were compiling this book, because you get names like the Gyges, which is sort of the original name for a giant that comes out of um, out of the Greek mythology. But then you get names like, you know, Jotun, which is clearly giants out of Norse mythology right. or Asgard exactly. mythology or Thule mythology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get names like Anak that come out of the Bible. We don't get Arba, Arba but we get uh, Anak and we got Sihon in the book. And so there's a relationship, obviously, to the biblical accounts. And from the Enoch accounts, you get in the book of Og, Oya, Ahaya, and Mawe, which are yes. in, in the books of Enoch, right? Um, right. you've, you've got a uh, reference in three, three, um, that is the six fingered ones that we don't get a name with them, but they're the six fingered ones. Um, and you also, you know, talking about dragon siblings out, out of yes. the East, yes. right. Amazing. Which is absolutely right. bizarre, which sort of goes back to that serpentine look of what I think a lot of the giants may have looked like as well. Yeah. Um, Let's see what else you've got. You've got, oh, th I mean, this one is just uh, blew me away when it says uh, Atlan. Well, uh, that's the house of, of the Aztecs, right? Yes, that goes back exactly. basically to, to Atlantis. Right. So how does that get in there, right? right. Tiamat, which is Sumerian, um, yes. and a Leviathan type creature. You've got the Danua, which are, you know, the Tuatha Yes. Dananua, the Dananua that, that show up, which are, right. you know, again, thought to be the same Scythians that show up. And they've got the blonde hair, blue eyed uh, version of the Tuatha Danan that goes north into Sweden and Norway and Germany and Russia. And then you got yes. the red hair, hazel eyed ones that go over to um, Ireland and then over to Scotland and to, and to England. So, um, you know, just off the top of my head, those are some of the ones that, you know, that came to mind that I just can't make a good argument as to how they make this into that book without something going on there in terms of additional knowledge or more veracity um, to the historical aspect uh, of, of these names. Right, right. And then you think of, uh, you know, if somebody, as some people speculate or want to believe, if somebody just made all of this up, I mean, the information that is contained within it, they would have to be really, I mean, highly researched and well, uh, you know, knowledgeable on so many aspects of of these different cultures, the names and yes. the include. I mean, I, I just don't think it would be possible. So there's got to yeah. be something, some veracity, some kind of verifiable context of some ancient manuscript. Yeah associated yeah. to it in my opinion yeah yeah or being provided the knowledge through some yes. sort of angel yes. or something like that like there's right. some right. there's more going on to um than meets the eye because I, again I, I agree it's just it's inexplicable with these types of details that that are showing up and right you know i wanted to just mention in terms of uh underlining what was what goes on in the minds of these people who think that they are superior and uh, from the history and some of the things that we have seen come down through history. I mean, they're describing humans in the book of Odd as fecal and vermin-like, <laughs> right. like, insect-like, right? right? Worms. Yeah, fecal um, like worms. Like they don't look at... <laughs> Yeah, they don't look at us as being more than insects, not only in size, but in terms of randness of creation in comparison to themselves. And they found it perfectly normal to slaughter humans, to drink humans' uh, blood, and to use humans as food um, right. and for sacrifice rituals. And yes. You know, they, they, we just had no value to them at all. So, and right. so now you look at how this elite class has treated the poor throughout history, and all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, that does make some sense that uh, when they say that they are descendants of, of these Nephilim, that they still hold those beliefs. Exactly. Yes, and their coldness, their callousness, I mean, their pervasive inclination for evil, it's all wrapped up in this text as well. I mean, it's uh, 
you can see the origins of these particular bloodlines stemming from these uh, these just evil callous giants and and then again you know the confirming witness of the book of Enoch and the way it all ties into the book of giants things of that nature um, there's yes I agree more to it than than what meets the eye yeah and uh, I you know so again I would recommend that people you know do uh, do read it and read it for context because it, it, it does some have some things that's going to turn your heads. Uh, it's an absolutely riveting read, as as, as I mentioned earlier, um, and use it for for some context in terms of understanding what um, the giants uh, were actually like, you know, the veracity of the giants, and the thought process of this cult or culture um, of giants and and their and their descendants. Um, so yeah, highly, highly would would highly recommend it. Yes, I, I do as well. And then then the the final story, which is um, you know Og coming up against Moshe, and then yeah. all the you know as we were talking about his his uh, just cursing him and calling him a fecal worm and all. It's it's almost funny the way that yeah. he uh, just goes into and the way that it. The, the text conveys how he feels about humanity and how he boasts. It reminds me of Goliath, you know, uh, when mm -hmm. he's boasting um, before the Israelites and the Philistine army and in the same manner, uh, just making Saul and the Israelites power in fear. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, the story in about Moses and, and, and Og in... Uh, the last book of King Og reflects what was going on fairly accurately in terms of the wars of the uh, of the Nephilim or of the Rephaim uh, in in the conquest of their promised land and even before they got there because the Og and Sihon and Median War and a few other wars before that happened even before they crossed the Jordan River, but. Og and Ogias, not only do they want to slay Moses, but they want to absolutely wipe Israel from the face of the earth, yes, yes. right? And, uh, and the reason is, is that they don't want Israel to survive so that they can produce the Messiah, who right. is going to uh, raise humans above not only the Nephilim, but the fallen angels in the future time. So they're yes. trying to prevent all of this. And so when you then go back and look at the Amalekite war that happens as Israel comes, um, you know, after they left Egypt, it's the first war and they're not even trained for war and they run right. up against um, the Amalekites. The Amalekites are as the offspring of uh Timna and Eliphaz, as I had mentioned earlier, and Timna is the daughter of Seir of the Horim, and Eliphaz is the son of Esau, you know, the descendant of Abraham. I think you have a, an attempt by the Amalekites to wipe Israel from the face of the earth there so that they can inherit those Magianic blessings, the covenant, and the birthrights that Esau lost um, in the in in the beginning to Jacob, right, right, absolutely, and, and you know again, this is the whole thing going back to Genesis three fifteen. I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed, uh, between um, you know the thy sons and her sons, and what Christ he, he would crush the head of the serpent as the serpent was nipping at his heel. That prophecy is played out and fulfilled all throughout. Even the, you know, David and Goliath, all of that, which a lot of people are familiar with, but that seems to be the only story. And yet the Bible is rife with interesting accounts of the wars of the giants uh, against Israel and amongst themselves. Yeah. And then in that, you know, serpent seed is directly connected with Isaiah 14 uh, with the yeah. serpent root and the, and the right. seraphim. And uh, so again, people want to read Isaiah 13 and 14 in context with this history and Genesis 3.15. Right. 
Yeah, they they're mentioned. Well, uh, Lucifer is mentioned as the abominable branch, like a uh, part of yeah. the family tree of humanity, and uh, his seed, the seed of evildoers, they are the serpent seed. They are the murderers of the prophets, as Christ said from Abel to Zacharias. Yep. Yeah. Well, Gary, we've got uh, three minutes remaining, brother. I want to give you a chance to. Uh, give out your website contact information once more, and then we'll end this in final content. Uh, absolutely uh, riveting. Terrific. And and again, if uh, people want that information, whether it's on second incursion or the series on Isaiah 13 to 14, um, or I also have a 14 part series of the Raphaim Wars that we were talking about that leads into. Uh, the, the conquest of the of the covenant land and shows you how this is giant wars all the way through and giant hybrids also on um, second incursion and or if you want uh, the biblical case for the sons of god being angels and not sethites i've got separate documents on that and the case for demons which everything that we're talking about here get a hold of me through the genesis 6 conspiracy.com that's genesis 6 the number 6 conspiracy.com and there's an email there and you can also get a hold of me uh, on twitter at gary wayne 63 and at facebook under gary wayne and if you ask for those documents ask them specifically so i know which ones that you want so i have a lot that i send out on a regular basis uh, and i will email them to you and it also will have an embedded in the Word document that'll do in PDF form, an embedded link to the Facebook commentary, which will give you some very interesting pictures that go along with the commentary. We appreciate you, brother. Also want to remind everybody that Gary will be uh, partnering up to do the Ask Me Anything shows. We will be announcing and releasing um, information on those broadcasts as they, you know, I don't remember the dates right now, but I uh, will be releasing that. Both Gary and I, myself, will be releasing it on our Facebook pages. And please, if you have questions you'd like to ask Gary about anything, you can say, send them to sacredwordpublishing.com or send them to Gary himself, and we'll compile and we'll um, make your inquiries available to the, you know, the, the whole community with regard to these Q and A shows. Thank you, brother. We greatly appreciate you, as always, your willingness. Uh, it's always a good time coming together with you and talking about whatever it is that we decide to cover. Well, thank you for having me, and hopefully we've shed some light on the Book of Og and uh, created a little bit more curiosity to dig a little bit more into this, because that's always uh, the goal, is to get information out for people. Right, absolutely. And this still is one of those texts that, you know, is not spoken about very much and few people seem to even know about it and so yes uh do check it out for yourself i think you'll be mind blown by what you read uh we'll do it again soon gary be blessed brother thank you you be blessed as well